So this summer, after some prodding from my friend Jake and some temptation, let's be honest, I bought a motorcycle. <laughs> there might be some riders here. Ride on. Yep. So Jake first started tempting me by, by rumbling up to my house on his nice Suzuki and saying, yeah, Mike, take a ride. Go for a ride. It was awesome. So I got to ride, and, and then he, he sweetened the deal by, by sending me an ad for this bike, this Honda, and he says, yeah, Mike, just... Why don't we just, just go look? Let's just go look. So he came, good friend as he is, he came with me on that Saturday to just look. And sure enough, it was a very sweet deal. And so I decided to buy it. So getting on that bike after uh, 15 years of not riding caused me to need to remember a few things about riding. Uh, how do you, where do you ride in the lane, right? To, to be sure you're seen by cars and to, to not get hurt. But it's just so much fun. You know, in BC, we've got these curving roads and mountain views. It's actually, you've got eyes on the road, not on the mountain views. It's very important. Um, I'm aware that each ride I take, maybe my wife on the back or my daughter as well, the, there's hundreds of decisions, little decisions that I'm making that could probably save my life or, or the lives of others. One riding website said it like this, in a crash, uh, a, a motorcycle rider is 30 times more likely to experience fatality than a driver in a car. So that's, uh, that's high stakes, but it's also high reward. But the point of riding a motorcycle isn't, isn't to just follow rules, right? That's not why we do it. We, we do it because when you do it well, the, the feeling of freedom and the joy of riding. So for example, one of my first rides on a warm night in Richmond where I live was, was riding down to Iona Beach. And one of the things, so I, you know, there might be a picture of that, one of the things I needed to remember, my son reminded me later, it's like, Dad, you, you, you can't just ride in a t-shirt. Like, what happens if, if you fall? So he reminded me of one of the things that rider websites talk about. You got to dress for the slide, not for the ride. So I, I went and got this jacket that has all the pads. Because you have to imagine yourself sliding across asphalt ugh, and decide, how do I want to do that? If it happens. I don't want to do it, but if it happens. So I got this jacket. <laughs> Let's take that off. So, um, remembering how to ride safely so I can enjoy the freedom of riding reminded me of the theme we have this August, uh, remembering all these amazing things that God would love us to remember so that we can live with freedom and joy if we would remember. And in this, again, this word remember, I love it, it's, that it's this image of a, of a reattachment, a remembering, a, like a surgeon might so on a missing finger to make you whole again. So this week, we are remembering to remember God's word. I'm going to take us first into Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, all about the treasure of God's word. So I'm going to read for us verses 9 to 16. Follow along. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Allow me to pray for us as we begin. Holy Father, I thank you that you've come among us and you've given us your words straight from your throne that we may live and have this life that you intend for us, of flourishing. Lord, would you do that again in us as we listen this morning to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to anchor us a bit in that, that final verse 16, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Delight is a great way, I think, to look at this, this uh, call to remember. But delight might not be the word you would think of or I would think of first when I think of the call back to remembering God's word. Delight speaks of desire, uh, of joy, of that sparkle in your eye, that spring in your step, sort of like I feel like when I'm going to go ride the Honda. Delight. It's a thrill. And so according to David, Israel's ancient king, centering his life, centering our lives 
on God's word is, is full of delight. And so we should practice it so we can live in that way God would have for us. So out of this psalm, I want to help us try to focus on two things this morning. And the first is this. God guides our life through directing our hearts. Let me read verse 10 and 11 again. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. So the authors of the Bible thought of the heart as this place where all our our emotions, our intentions, and, and therefore our actions reside. And Psalm 19 is all about turning our heart towards God. And so in these two verses, there's a few things that David wants to turn us back to. And so David himself, first he pledges, I seek you, Lord, with all my heart. So this call this morning requires something from us. It requires a seeking on our part, an active stance. And it, and it promises, and David promises God, I don't want to live with an undivided heart. I want all of me, all of my heart to focus on you. And, and that's the thing. That's what God wants to build in us. It's, it's the heart. It's not just these externals. It's the heart. So then David asks of God, do not let me stray from your commands. Uh, straying. It, it leaks. God's commands tend, tend to leak from our heart. Just like before our road trip this, this summer, I found out that our, our air conditioning had leaked and it was all gone. And going into the heat of Alberta, I, we needed to recharge it. We needed to refill it. And then thirdly in here, David states that the secret to God guiding our heart is by hiding God's word in our heart. And so the God, uh, David knows that, that God's word needs, needs to be guardrails, a guidepost, so that we wouldn't, what he says, to, to sin or to, to veer away from God. Last week, Craig helpfully uh, brought a word from scripture, uh, avon, the word for sin, one of the words for sin, avon. This word that sort of describes how our hearts naturally sort of turn away, twist, not stay true to the way that we're designed If I was to apply that to writing, write my own writer's Bible, I might say something like this. I have hidden writer safety rules in my heart that I may not veer towards disaster. That's what God wants. That's what he's after in us. So a question for you. What words of God may be or have been or are in your life this morning? How how could they, how will they Uh, guide you? How would God maybe need to reattach them, reattach your habits to to going there as your source of life? We have to consider the opposite. What would happen? What does happen when we try to go it alone? Ride by our own rules, set up our own guardrails and determine our best life for us. Surely we've learned enough, maybe even from God or other sources, we can direct our own lives, right? Well, I don't think we say that, and I don't, but I do it. I sort of fall into it. God's people, uh, hundreds of years before David wrote these words, were facing a similar situation. They had been slaves in the land of Egypt, and God was delivering them out to a land he was going to give them, land of Canaan. They were going to enter a land uh, of many peoples, many religions, many ways, a pluralistic society. Does it remind you of anywhere, like where we live? Moses knew. He knew how people are. He knew how we are. He knew there was going to be things they could not forget if they were going to stay on God's path. So in Deuteronomy 8, he writes them this. Allow me to read. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied... When you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So Moses knew his people. He knows us. It's like us. When life gets comfortable, what do we do? We tend to veer away. So they are at risk, Moses is telling them, they are at risk of having a heart that will become proud and, and forget God. So what, what sort of maybe awful thing might happen to forget God? Well, things that don't sound very awful. When you eat and are satisfied, when you have nice homes to settle in, 
when things are going well and, and your profits are increasing. Now, these are all good things. These are things God wants for them and, and wants for us. These are part of flourishing lives, and we're going to be part of their life as they came into this new land. But isn't, isn't it just that in our world, whether it's through a marketing campaign that's all around us hundreds of times a day, right from young to old, isn't it that we're lured in other directions? If you just had uh, maybe that, that other job, if you had that nicer car, if you could live in this kind of house, in this neighborhood, then you'd have the life you've always dreamed of. So th these things are good, but God in his word is trying to say, no, these aren't the source of your life. They cannot, they should not be the source of your life. I had a, a small sort of example in this in my life of sort of forgetting and, and sort of veering. Um, I got to go on a holiday recently. So near the end of July, I heard my brother was going mountain biking and camping in the Okanagan, so I actually invited myself along, and he was happy to have me with his friends. It was awesome. We got to go to Vernon, to Revelstoke, to Golden. We, we actually avoided all the smoke. We had these five amazing days. And honestly, the, the nicest part of my week was, was just waking up in these beautiful places and, and not doing sort of the, the have-tos that I did. So I kind of just let go of everything. I didn't have to make any decisions. They told me where we we're going to ride. They organized the meals at night. I just had an amazing time. But by about day three, I noticed something was off, sort of inside. I noticed where my mind would wander and, and the, sort of those, you know, those temptations, those things, the way that I would see people would just sort of creep up. I don't know if, you, if you're like this, but you sort of know, you have these inner hunches when some, something inside isn't right, even though maybe outside it's amazing, something inside doesn't match. That's what was happening to me in my holiday. I was out of my routine. So by day four, I, I knew what I needed to do. I, I sort of got up early, got away from the guys, and sort of went on a little walk, which is my normal, that's what I do at home. I, I do that in the morning. And I typically listen to Pray As You Go, this app you may have heard us talk about, which reads you scripture, sings a song, and just really says, welcome the presence of God. So as I did this, I was just refreshed again. You know, the, 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 the luxuries and the ease of the holiday matched with God's presence. And he started bringing me back to myself, back to himself, how he designed. He came alive in me. So that leads me to my second point from Psalm 119. The point is when we remember to meditate on his word, he turns us back. His life comes into us. He turns us to his life. So let me read verse 15. I meditate on your precepts. I consider your ways. Meditating, walking out God's ways, it doesn't come automatically. Like I said, it, it takes effort, intention. One author said, God's ways are, are a path to follow, a way of life, something to practice, something to walk in, something to run in with enthusiasm. Because what, what God wants to do, what he wants to see happen in our heart is actually that his life uh, would get lodged in us, and his life would bubble up in us. So Jesus said some similar things that resonate with Psalm 119. In the book of John, chapter 14, he's giving some last words to his followers before he goes. You may know these words. It says this, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So what Jesus is saying here is that through his Holy Spirit, as we learn to know him and keep his commands, he'll actually come alive in us. He'll, he'll be among us. Now, I think we know this. We know this whether it's to a family member or to a friend. We sort of know what works for them in, in that relationship. And we sort of know how to honor those ways, not out of duty, but out of out pure love. And that's what Jesus says will happen as we know and meditate and remember his words. He says something else in chapter four, a very famous story you may have heard. He's talking to a woman, a, an ostracized woman in her village, and he happens to meet her at a water well. And he's, she's lived a, a life far from any of God's commands and ways. And so he's trying to describe what God's presence and God's word would be like in her if she would turn to him. And he says this, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus wanted that woman and he wants us today to know that that when we meditate on his word, it's going to be like a refreshing water bubbling up through dry cracks. Maybe it's our soul that's dry. It's going to refresh us because it will be his very presence. The word of God goes on to say, it's not just words. It's Jesus himself is the word, the living word that comes to reside in us, that rich relationship. And that's what's on offer. And I could continue. I could give you more examples of saying, oh, you should try this. But actually I know, and maybe you know, you can only get this by trying, by trying it yourself. So this morning, I imagine there's some of you here that you know this and you do this. Maybe each day or regularly in the week, you you have a favorite chair. You get up and you sit, you grab your coffee. Or like me, you go for a walk and you expose yourself to God's word. I want to implore you, just keep doing this. Maybe you do this with your life group. Do this together. This is meant to be done together. Or maybe you're like me, that's what I just experienced. You've done it before, but you've sort of gotten out of the habit. Maybe you, you don't do that routine. You, you sort of, you're not in a life group. You're not, you don't have patterns that bring you back. I want you to consider this invitation this morning. Get back on. Go back to that word of God that you know. See what happens. But maybe you're here and you've never tried this because, hey, you're, you're new to the faith or you're just seeking faith. This is an invitation to you to try it. to to get your hands on a Bible. Uh, Someone here would love to give you a Bible or on your phone, there's the Bible app. There's these great sources of God's uh, of life. Try it, go for it. Just like a creation, the Bible says, God spoke his word. He said, let there be light. And there was light. God's spoken word creates. And to this very day, God is in the business of creation. As he speaks his word, life and light gets created in us and around us. He comes alive. So in God's grace, he guides us away from these paths we choose. He guides us away from setting our own rules and our own guardrails because he knows it's it's not what we're designed for. He knows that we'll end up with the false life, the counterfeit life rather than the real life. And I love how Jesus says in his word, he says, you know, if you try to seek your own source of life through your own means, you actually won't find it. The very thing you want will, will slip out of your grasp. But if you seek a source of life that's in me, you will find it. He actually dares us to try it, invites us to try it. Try to find life in him because he wants to guide our heart and he wants, as we then meditate and and make these efforts, he wants to come alive in us. Again, not because of of a religiously obligated life, a dutiful life, a life full of flourishing. In this life, as you know, I don't have to remind us life will throw at us despair, discouragement, struggle, comparison. Our city is full of it. Struggles will will persist that we we didn't want to happen and we can't seem to make them end. I don't know, maybe that's where you find yourself this week or this morning. Maybe you've tried so many ways to dig yourself out of that hole, to get back on a good path of life, but you can't. Even making decisions is hard. You might find yourself in a fog. What God wants you to know this morning is in that fog, there's a hand reaching out. It's the hand of our maker himself, of Jesus, saying, I want to guide you back. I want to guide you away from disaster and towards life. I want to guide you where you're having struggle to have hope, where there might be despair that's sort of ongoing to have more life, where where grief persists, presence, presence of God. He's like, I'm with you. In it. That's the kind of Jesus we have. This is the invitation. This past week, I, I came across a song in Pray As You Go, actually, by Audrey Assad. It's called Wood and Nails. It's by Porter's Gate. I won't sing it, but I, wanna, I would just want to speak two of the first lines. It says this about Jesus. It says, O humble carpenter, down in your hands and knees, look on your handiwork and build a house so you may dwell in me. This is what God wants to do. He wants to build the home of his presence in us. And the song goes on to say, it was was through wood and nails in in your scar-born hands. That's why we turn to the cross each week. That's how Jesus built God's life 
into us as humanity. That's what he offers us, his living word, a call back to himself, his presence. So what could we do? I want to suggest two simple things as we end our time this morning. Two very simple things. Firstly, choose a scripture. If you've been at this for a while, you know it. Maybe it's a psalm, maybe it's another verse. Go back to it. But maybe you're new and, and you don't know what you might choose. Well, maybe it's the psalm I just read, 119, or, or some other verse that you'll find in, in Scripture. Choose a verse. Then what you do is I want to invite you to, to just read it slowly in your morning. Just read it a couple times. Do that throughout the day. Do it again the next day. As you read it, as you repeat it, as you meditate, I, I sort of want to, I want to promise, extend the Bible's promise that God will come alive in us and around us. You may notice less jealousy, less comparison, less despair. Instead, you may notice more peace, more joy, more contentment. Isn't that what we want? This is what our Lord wants for us. I'm going to invite us now to pray. Bow with me. Lord, as it says in, in the Psalm in 119, I rejoice in following your statutes as one who rejoices in great riches. Lord, this is what you want. This is what you long for us is uh, to find, to stumble upon great riches, riches that lead to life everlasting. And it's your word in us. Would you guide us in our 10th community towards you, towards your life, towards your word? Would you, would you spur us on maybe to, to seek help in this, to seek the prayer team, to seek our friends, to help us find our way back to you, to remember you. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.